Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we have Mr. Addison Hosner, commentator, Young Voices, attorney, writer, and mediator, contributes to outlets including the Washington Examiner, Counterpunch, and is a licensed attorney in Florida. Good day, sir. Welcome. Hello, doctor. How you doing? Doing quite well, man. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, we're going to talk about the criminal justice system, in particular terms, private prisons. I don't want to presume what you know or believe about those items, so I will give you an opportunity to express your sentiment. All right. So when it comes to private prisons, my personal beliefs on the situation is that it started out as a good idea. We were trying to figure out a way to help the federal government contain all these inmates that were increasing at a rapid percentage. But now it's at a point that's become bloated and I think counterproductive from what the initial objectives were. It's troublesome seeing the recidivism rates compared to what the public prisons are. And so as a whole, I'm in favor of trying to reform the situation, if not outright getting rid of them. I'm sure Biden's executive order that he put forth earlier this year, but we can discuss it in more depth. All right, good stuff, man. So I agree with about 75% of what you said. I don't think it was ever a good idea. That's the part that I disagree with you on. I'm gonna take you back historically to the Constitution, right? So we all say, well, you know, 13th Amendment freed slaves, but it did not. The 13th Amendment actually did not free slaves. What the 13th Amendment did is create prisons, and it created an industry for prison labor, is what the amendment did. And if you read the wording of the amendment, it says very clearly that yes, Slavery is abolished except for punishment for crime. So what really happened in the American social justice and criminal justice construct? Well, they figured out a way to arrest people more, in particular black people, specifically marginalized groups, right? And so now you have this big machine, this big industry known as the prison industrial complex, which has been codified and the catalyst connects back to the amendment of the constitution. So I never thought it was a good idea. I always thought the idea should have been reformed. That is the idea. So you had a movement where people were talking more about reform a few decades ago. And we actually had some reform inside of prisons. But private prisons did not have to do the same thing as publicly held prisons did. So what was the reform? Well, the greatest, the number one deterrent to recidivism is education. So if you actually give someone the education inside of prison, a skill, a college degree, we have found through statistical data that is the greatest deterrent to them coming back inside of that jail. Why do you think they eliminated those programs and private prisons never really even wanted them in the first place? I think a lot of it has to do with trying to cut costs. If we look at the data for private prisons in general, they seem to hire fewer staff, they spend less money That's to true. train staff, and then that results into a Looking like a deficit as far as the expense. So the public, you know, the government can sit here and say, well, we've we've done what we intended to do, which was to cut costs and house inmates. But the reality is, it's had a negative impact on those inmates themselves. I agree with a lot of what you mentioned in here. the The issue with the recidivism rates is the goal was, well, maybe private prisons through the overcrowding that is in our public system will allow these inmates to get that education and rehabilitative programs to not be back in prison. But by and large, we're seeing that the percentages are about the same as public prisons, and in a lot of cases, worse. And so, yes, you're saving costs per inmate, and so you're cutting these programs to save that cost. But when you're only saving about it's around three or four thousand dollars an inmate in total time of incarceration, if they're coming right back to prison and they're doing the process again, you're not saving money. You're continuing the system that is just keeping them in check. And as you mentioned, people who are either impoverished or people of color. Are, are, are targeted through our own criminal justice system. And, and a lot of that I think has to go, we go back to the drug war that was put in place through Nixon. And that's where a lot of it starts. And you know, so yeah, this, this, is going, this is going to be the easiest debate I've ever had, brother. I agree with virtually everything that you just said. Um, I do want to highlight one caveat when we say cut costs. Cut costs is another way of saying make more money. Exactly. Okay. So they really just wanted to make more money. And, and the reason why they eliminated these programs is because the programs were working. They were actually decreasing criminal recidivism at a significantly high rate. 
And they now as an industry, they cannot sustain that model and sustain their profits. And so they got rid of these programs and made a justification to the American people that it was somehow cutting costs. But the truth is the back door of the numbers says otherwise. It says you actually have more cost because of the revolving door connected to recidivism. So let me read something I think is quite interesting. Private prisons in the United States of America incarcerated 115,000 people in 2019. That represents about eight or nine percent of the total state and federal population of prisoners, okay? Since 2000, the number of people housed in private prisons has actually increased by 32% compared to the overall rise in the prison population, that's only 3%. Well, here's why. States that still allow for private prisons, they have a built in incentive to keep those industries running. Now, are they doing things like, um, well, we're gonna just start locking up more people to get more money. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. So let's say you have a state that's big in private prisons, right? That means that state company or the company inside of that state that owns that private prison, they give money to the governor. They give money to state lawmakers. What do the, those state lawmakers do? They refuse to pass policies that would reform criminal justice that would actually lead to less incarcerated people. That's how it works. They don't go out and say, we gotta lock up more people. Nobody does that. But they do not present legislation that would create remedy in our society so that less people are incarcerated. Do you agree with me on that sentiment? I'm 100% with you, doctor. You know. The problem we see is if you look at a lot of these contracts, the there's no in, uh, incentive to actually reduce the incarceration. Yeah. And I think if you want to fix the problem, if the goal is really to keep people out of prison, it's to fix this system of injustice. Why don't you incentivize a bonus? Perhaps I'm not for the privatization of prisons. I think it's it's kind of grotesque when you think about incarceration mm-hmm. sure. making profit on that. That that seems un-American to me, you know, in my core. But if you're going to have to Privatize it and make profits, since that's this crony capitalism is what we're all about here. It seems. Why not incentivize less incarceration, less use of the private prisons as a way to a conserve money, since the taxpayer is losing that money, whether it's going to public or private prisons. And I think that in and of itself would maybe you know push some of these governors and state legislatures more in line with trying to figure out ways of how we can fix the system itself, because you have three different spectrums within criminal justice. You have the law enforcement which is the police on the ground. You have the judicial system, which is the attorneys and the, and the law, uh, judges. And then you finally have the actual legislative side, which is writing the black letter law that is being enforced by the other two. And right now, there's no incentive for state legislatures to remove these privatized prisons. The prisons have no reason because there's no incentive for them to want that to occur. And then it goes all the way down to our current system, which we've been seeing over the last few years of police officers using abuse of discretion and having mm-hmm. no consequence through qualified immunity. So um, it seems to be quite the circle here. So I'm all for trying to tear it down. And again, I think we're in, we're in pretty close agreement here on all yeah. of that. Yeah, we really are, man. It really thrills me to, to hear you say what you're saying. Um, selective prosecution or, or prosecutorial discretion. Uh, people usually talk about that in the context of the district attorney or the state prosecutor. The truth is prosecutorial discretion starts with the responding officer. That's where it starts, all right? The officer can say, you know what, this is not a big deal, let's keep it moving. Or let me charge you with everything I can, including jaywalking. Let me put you in jail and overcharge you to the max. And we know how those things work out in communities that they feel they can marginalize due to the socioeconomic reality of that neighborhood. So yes, it has to also start there. But since this is a conversation about prison, right, and prison reform. Let me ask you this question because I have a novel idea. If you are a private prison, you should be sub- subject to the uh, same to the same protocol as a government prison, because all private prisons operate with some level of subsidy from the state or federal government. So there should be a rule attached to that subsidy or that money. Number two. Make sure that there's a mandate to create educational programs inside of that institution of incarceration. And if they do not, there's a monetary penalty to the point of closing them down. And or three, just make all of the damn prisons illegal. All of the private prisons against the law, 
Because you know what? Other industrialized nations that are democracies, guess what they don't have, brother? Private damn prisons. That, that's a totally ridiculous idea to most of the uh, civilized world or developed nations, private prisons. But it's something that we do here as normative. What are your thoughts? Again, I, I'm in agreement with what you're saying. Uh, and I think there's something else that's been you know, a part of this that would assist. And, and you mentioned the state attorneys and the, and the selective prosecution. Um, you know, currently right now, the, the American Bar Association recommends a public defender to only have 150 felony cases in any given moment or 400 misdemeanor cases, which I can tell you as an attorney, just having 400 cases, you're, you're, you're done. There's no way you're able to give the time needed to each one of these. Uh, and so to add one more thing, we need to also look into funding and trying to find ways to, to assist the public defenders and also find ways to make sure that the prosecution team isn't going after certain crimes simply to meet a certain goal that's been placed before them from their own state governments and to prosecute for things that aren't frivolous. No one should be serving five years in jail for possession of half an ounce of marijuana, for example. That, that, that's, that's unacceptable in a country that has so many states with legal weed at this point. Yep. Um, that goes right into hands. You mentioned the states with private prisons. If I recall, when I was looking at some statistics recently, Georgia is predominantly ahead of any other state in our nation when it comes to privatized prisons and using them. And a lot of the southern states I find are guilty of this as well. There's a few in the north, as you know, in the northeast, but I do find that there's there's an issue with states that typically seem to lean more to the right and or have a pretty verbose, uh, let's just say, individuals who are for them. And yep. the only way to fix that, again, we have to start at the top, and that's going to be the you know legislative branch. How do we get there? That's the million dollar question. But I think the more level headed people we have and the more that society cares about these issues, the problem is it doesn't affect everyone. There's 2.2 million prisoners. How many of us actually know someone who's in prison? I can say as you know, as a white man in this country, it's I have been benefited from the fact that I have not been under that you know systemic issue. I can go out and do things and not feel like I'm gonna be prosecuted for them. Um, but I know there's many families in the South and in, in poverty that have family members yeah. in prison. So, it's getting the right people to care, and it's how do you make that happen? How do you make them feel what those who are under that foot are feeling? And I, I think until we can find the solution to that, it's gonna be difficult to get the legislation to come around and to get these state governments to uh, to provide the funding that you're asking for. Because if that's yeah. possible, that's the only way we could potentially save any type of privatized prisons, which I am all for getting rid of them. But again, you know, small steps if we have to put educational programs, rehabilitative programs back in there. And give those prisoners the fair shot that they deserve to not fall back into the you know victim to becoming incarcerated once again, just a few months down the road. 98% of incarcerated people will actually be free. I want people to remember that. 98% of people who are incarcerated will one day be free. They will be in the normative society. And we treat them as if they're not part of our culture or society. Um, you said something really interesting, but true. And I know it's your reality, I'm glad you said it. You don't know anybody in prison. I know 11 people in prison that I grew up with, 11 people. Some of them, they went wayward, others, they were targeted and got caught up in a bad situation, okay? But they went to prison. My reality from the community I'm from and yours is different. But let me show you how we're connected, brother. Let me show you how we're connected, me and you. You're in law school right now, right? I'm sorry, you're a lawyer right now. <laughs> I'm in law school right now. I'm a second year law student. I'm also a college professor, but I'm also a formerly incarcerated man as well. When I was 17 years old, I got arrested for a felony in my local community. The state of Georgia had just passed a law that said now 17 year olds have to be prosecuted as adults, no exceptions. There was no flexibility with the prosecutor at all. It was statutory. You know why they passed that law? To make sure they could put people like me, 17 year old black men at that time, behind bars for a long time. That's why they passed the law. But there was a district attorney, this DA, he didn't like that law. His name is J. Tom Morgan. He was more progressive than most at that time. He didn't like the law, but he didn't think about it. So what did he do? 
He decided to create a rule in his office, a policy that said, we're going to not give anyone who's 17 a felony in this office. We're gonna give them a first offender act because under the law, you can still do that. Well, to this day, brother, I'm felony free because I got to take advantage of the first offender program and the platforms and the colleges that I teach at and lecturing around the country, I could not do those things with a felony conviction. So that's how you and I are connected because whose show are you on today? You're on my show. And if there was not reform, I would likely not have this program because I was able to take advantage of a progressive policy. I bring that to your attention, brother, because I think you are such an authentic individual in your field that we need to amplify your voice. And while you may have a different social experience than me, the connection is still here. You and I are still connected, all right? Oh, oh first of all, I, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I mean that, I, I I practice a lot of you know civil litigation and a lot of family law. And I see a lot of domestic violence in the criminal field. That's a lot of where I'm at. Mm -hmm. um, and. It's, it's really difficult to hear those stories of, of hearing it work. Um, my frustrations with being a practicing attorney, I, I can tell you right now, I tell clients all the time how the court system doesn't, it's not built to work as efficiently as it should. And it doesn't yeah. help those who truly need it. And I got into the field because I wanted to help people, truly help people who could not help themselves. And I know that sounds naive to some, but that's really where, where my head was at. And so to hear your story, doctor, and, and to see how this all played out for you, I mean, I, I can't, uh, Hey, good luck in the finishing out law school. <laughs> Thank you, brother. A lot of fun, but also just you know, really, that's inspiring. I'm glad to hear it. It's, it's well, finally something good. Yeah, well, I'm I'm glad to hear people like you say what you say, man. Uh, thank you for being on the program, brother. You are invited back anytime. Okay, keep fighting the good fight. Hey, I appreciate, it, Doctor. We'll be in touch. We'll bye be bye. in touch.